my name is Ilana Horn, and I'm one of the leaders for the Community for Advancing uh, Discovery Research Pre Pre K 12. That's a mouthful, so we just call it CADRE. Um, and uh, part of our goal is to help folks who are in the CADRE space improve their research to broaden um, the pool of people who do work in this space. And yes, please say hi in the chat. Um, I'm really excited to have this conversation today um, with our great panelists. It's going to be about using video in education research. Um, video has really changed the way we do things. And so we have invited some panelists here today who use video in a range of interesting and creative ways in uh, their research. So we have today Heather Hill from Harvard, Joanne Lobato from San Diego University, Nanette Sego from West Ed, and Erica Walker from Columbia. And um, they are all using video in their research, their DRK-12 research, in a variety of ways. And um, we're going to have them talk to you about it. But before uh, I start with our panelists, I'm just going to give you a little bit of an overview of what our agenda is. Um, First, I'm just going to talk our way into what, what are some of the questions that people have about using video in STEM teaching and learning research. Um, we're going to have the panelists go in the following order. We are going to have uh, Dr. Erica Walker go first, and then Dr. Joanne Lobato, Dr. Sego, and Dr. Hill. Um, they'll each give about a uh, 15-minute uh, presentation, but as we go, please use the Q&A to go ahead and put your questions in there. I'm going to try to moderate and keep track of them. Um, use the chat all you want to say hi, to, you know, pitch it, you know, pipe in as you might, like, whisper to a friend or comment, but let's use the Q&A for questions um, that you want me to present to the panelists, and you can also specify if you want a particular panelist or panelist's to respond to those questions when we get to that. Um, so video has really been in use in DRK-12 research and research of that type for a long time now. Uh, I tried to find a picture of the first classroom video research I did in the 1990s, where we had those big giant cameras and we had big tripods and we had to like stand on desks. Um, the closest I could come is that fellow in the striped shirt on the top left there of that slide. It's not as big as the cameras we use though, but um, cameras have really shrunk, opening a lot of possibilities and going from VHS tapes or even um, Hi8 tapes that you used to have to change out, you used to have a timer set because you knew you had 30 minutes and then you had to try to switch out the tape. Anyway, I will, I'll stop the old fogey stories, but basically the video technology has changed so rapidly and it's really opened up a lot of possibilities for what we can do in our research. Um, at the far right, I have a, sc a screenshot of um, a child with a GoPro on his head who's playing in a math playground. That was from a study that Melissa Grisolfi and I did, a DRK-12 study. So just to sort of talk about all the different ways that people have begun to use these smaller, more nimble, um, easier to process um, kinds of video in their work. There are some um, texts out there and guides out there um, that offer us some ways of thinking about video. But I really do think that when I think about the mission of Cadre to broaden access to research and sort of share um, wisdom and, you know, try to uh, even the playing field a little bit so you don't have to have necessarily um, been brought up under the wing of somebody who uses video um, in sophisticated ways in their research in order to be able to propose a research design with that. That's that's kind of how I thought that video would be a really good topic for a panel like this to kind of share um, out some of the ways that people are using video um, in the DRK-12 space. So up here, I have some of the resources that I know of and that I share with my students um, about 
using video and teacher education about the idea of video recording is theory. Um, that's a piece by Rogers Hall, who is in the picture on the bottom right using video um, in one of his projects in a classroom. And the idea is that there's sort of this idea that video is just about capturing things, but we know that how we capture, how we frame things, it, it gives us different possibilities for analysis and so on. Um, there's, there are ethical issues around video. So I'm gonna turn it over to our panelists now to talk about um, their projects. Uh, the questions that we posed to them um, to organize their presentations was we asked for them to describe what their research is about. And we asked them to focus particularly on the design decisions that they had to make around video use because it's, all, it's not straightforward. Um, in the project I'm working on now, we spent a whole year piloting different camera setups to try to figure out what was going to help us get to our question, um, our questions um, the best. And uh, then we also just asked for a little bit of wisdom of practice. What are the kinds of things that they've learned along the way that maybe is the kind of thing that they would tell a student or a mentee, but not necessarily make it to a method section of a research paper. So without further ado, I am going to pass it over to Dr. Erica Walker and um, we'll take your questions at the end, but go ahead and write them in for now. Thank you so much, Lonnie. Um, hello, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. I am Erica Walker, and I'm going to talk with you about um, a project um, funded by DRK12 called Storytelling for Mathematics Learning and Engagement. Um, this is a three-year project that began, that began under the auspices of Teachers College, um, Columbia University, and um, is continuing. We are in our final really six months. Um, so it's been a very um, inspiring and engaging journey. I just want to give a, a acknowledgement to this wonderful picture by Jacob Lawrence, this wonderful painting. Um, it just reminds us that still pictures can tell a story and certainly video can tell a story. So um, if you're interested in that painting, it's from the migration series and um, you can easily find the entire series online. Um, so as I mentioned, this is a three-year study and we are seeking to address um, three key issues in mathematics education. Um, narrow conceptions of math as a discipline, sort of getting away from people just thinking that mathematics is about computation. Um, the lack of racial, racially and ethnically diverse role models for mathematics in terms of representation in you know, media, school curriculum, the public imagination even. And finally, a paucity of resources for instruction um, to harness students' early interest and engagement across racial and gender groups. Um, you can look at this lovely graphic, but um, I don't really have a lot of time to go through everything that's in it. But the way the project was conceived was that we would uh, collect and curate stories from mathematicians. So the mathematicians participated in about hour-long uh, interviews. And we would collect these stories. We had a common um, protocol to, to garner these stories. And the stories were about their learning of mathematics within and beyond schools. Um, once we completed the longer interview, then we would excerpt you know, uh, interesting and engaging snippets of stories from those longer interviews. And those shorter videos were going to be um, and are being embedded in a K through eight mathematics curriculum. Our curriculum partner is Amplify. Uh, based in New York City. But those short videos would also, going beyond the Amplify curriculum, would become part of a more extensive digital database of math stories, aligned with K-8 um, math content and other topics, such as, you know, how do you study mathematics? Um, what are the connections between mathematics and other disciplines? And things like that. So it's an, it's an iterative kind of review process. We want to make sure that we are choosing the snippet videos or the excerpted videos that they're most engaging for students, but also for teachers, because we want teachers to use them um, in their curriculum and beyond. We think that these um, videos uh, will have a, a life beyond a, um, a standard curriculum. And so we are um, working on getting additional funding to, to study how people, parents or community leaders might use these, these shorter videos. 
So I can share a bit more about, about that, but that's the general plan. Um, we submitted this in 2019, pre-COVID. So when the pandemic happened, we had to adjust and we ended up using video much more than we thought. And I'll tell you a bit more about that shortly. So here were our research questions. Um, so basically, overall, we wanted to explore the use of mathematic storytelling you know, through these, these video snippets and their impact on K through eight teacher and student mathematics learning and engagement. Um, so the first question, how do digital mathematics stories um, affect teachers and students' mathematics engagement? And specifically, we were interested in looking at for teachers, how they might influence teachers' beliefs about students, about teaching practice, about mathematics. And for students, how do they influence students' um, you know, sense of belonging to mathematics, interests, other attitudes towards um, mathematics? Um, and then the second question is italicized, which I'm not going to have time to tell you anything about that, but you can see it and read it. Um, but I bet you probably want to see an example of one of these math stories. So I'm going to show that now. Hopefully everything will work. Hold, please. Let's see. My name is uh, Tasha Ennis, and I am an associate provost uh, for research at Spelman College, as well as an associate professor of mathematics. I am an applied mathematician. And so what do I mean by that? I mean, I take my math knowledge and the theory and I apply it to real world problems. So I feel as if my math solves problems to help the world. And I know that sounds very, um, I don't know, cliche or grandiose, but I really want to see my math in action, right? And as an applied mathematician, I can do that. As an applied mathematician, when I was in grad school, I worked closely with the Federal Aviation Administration because I was trying to help them estimate or figure out the number of planes that can land at an airport when there's bad weather outside. Because when there's bad weather, you can't see as well, which means that you can't have certain runway configurations because you don't want the planes to collide. Also, when there's bad weather and you can't see, you have to have more of a separation between planes. Um, and so you would have less flights that can land at an airport in a given time frame. At the time, I used data mining to figure out, to just collect data on just looking at, um, uh, looking at the weather conditions that contributed to a particular, what's called AAR, so airport arrival rate. So I would look at the conditions, so wind speed, wind direction, and so forth. What was the A AAR depending on that? And so that's what I used data mining, and that kind of helped inform the development of my mathematical model. All right, so um, essentially imagine, you know, 89 more of those. So we interviewed 30 mathematicians and we exerted at least three um, short kind of snippets from each interview. And so we're building this library of 90 clips. And we do have some preliminary data, which I know is not <laughs> what I'm really meant to be talking about, but I think it helps to contextualize how video, the use of video evolved in the study. So um, what we're finding so far, so uh, very briefly, we've conducted focus groups with teachers and students. And teachers focus group data, um, and we'll have a paper about this soon, um, we're uh, presenting at AERA, really centers on five key themes, um, the content, the pedagogy, production aspects, teachers had a lot to say about the animations and what animations they thought should be added. For example, potential for engagement for students, particularly Black and Latinx students who are our focus um, focal groups and inspiration for teachers. So teachers would often talk about how a mathematician talking about a particular topic or issue inspired them in some way. Um, so that's kind of the key themes from the teachers. From the students and um, this is one thing about doing uh, our data collection using Zoom and having resulting videos, because now we're in people's homes instead of people coming to us at a university or something to participate in a focus group. 
So the students who participated are largely grades three through eight, but we had visitors in the focus groups. We had parents, um, we had one very engaged six-year-old and um, all of these people, um, particularly the students were very engaged by the videos. And here are some representative quotes um, I chose these because um, a few of these are really linked to the video you just saw about aviation. So kids were like, I hadn't heard the term applied, mathematician. Um, there are other videos where mathematicians are talking about board games and how probability is involved um, in playing games. Um, students commented on how diverse the group was. Um, and how they like seeing um, one, one young man said, I think it's great that we see women mathematicians because you don't typically see that. So the, the students are very uh, taken with uh, these videos. So those are, that's just a little tease of some of the results that we're having. And I just wanna share this brief note because one thing that did come up in some of our teacher focus groups were um, the mathematician videos you know, range in terms of they're talking about very elementary concepts, or they could be talking about very advanced concepts. And about the advanced concepts, some teachers felt, well, my students wouldn't be ready for that, or they're not interested in it. I really would like to see videos more tied to, you know, my fourth grade standards. And what the students said, um, the students had a lot to say about that. They really engaged with the mathematician who was telling whatever the story, regardless of the content. And one student said, I like how they prepare you for higher math and stuff that we are probably not going to get, that we're probably not going to learn for a very long time, but they prepared it for it, prepared us for it. So then it won't be as hard as it would be for other people. So this, this student recognizes that even if I don't understand everything that they're talking about, later I'll probably understand it and I'm, I'm glad to know about it now, which was a very, very cool thing to see. So now I'm going to turn um, specifically to the sometimes surprising role of video in this project. I just want to give you kind of a backstage view of how this happened. So in this screenshot, you can see that I and um, one of our research assistants is uh, we're interviewing Dr. Nara Chamberlain. Um, so behind the stream yard, that's the platform we use. There's a producer who is like making sure our sound is good. The lighting is, is good. And the focus is really meant to be on the mathematician talking. Once the interview was done, it was um, uploaded to a, a, a platform called Temi. And what Temi will do is generate an AI transcript. So you're reading part of the transcript here. And this allowed our team to kind of go in and highlight certain passages because we're thinking again about the three excerpts that we want to, to garner. So we're just highlighting for interesting stories, links to math content. There's, there's a, a note panel, so we could just write notes there. So Temi was useful um, for that. The transcripts, of course, weren't perfect, but this was a way for us to, to go in kind of immediately after the interview and um, have a, a set of our, our team um, kind of review and, and, and choose potential stories for production for those three short video excerpts. So we have ended up using video in two different domains, um, mainly you know, design and research. So I want to share a few things about each. Um, as I mentioned, we use StreamYard to digitally record these interviews. We use Temi, as I just discussed, um, for to identify key moments and engaging stories and curriculum topics for excerpts. And then we used video and the embodied engagement of mathematicians to create and choose animations in consultation with the production team and also the curriculum um, company. What do I mean by embodied engagement? Um, well, when mathematicians are telling stories, they are often, often using their bodies to emphasize a point. Sometimes they had props. So this inspired um, the production team to think about the animations. For example, Dr. Ennis, who we just saw, when she was talking about planes landing, they used that to, to generate those, those animations to make it more you know, vibrant for students. So that's what happened in terms of design. I'm sure there are other things that I could say about design, but this gives you just a little hint of how um, we thought about video for that, that part. In the research, um, as I mentioned, uh, the COVID pandemic sort of put pay to our initial plans of 
doing things on site. We had planned to actually interview mathematicians on site in their offices. Now we couldn't do that. We had to do StreamYard. We had planned to conduct focus groups um, on site in schools or at you know, universities in various cities across the country. Um, that couldn't work. So we um, were able to shift and do all the data collection by Zoom. Um, we are now, that does mean that we're now coding and analyzing video data in addition to you know, printed transcripts that we might have. And we're on a constant quest for good tools to do this. Um, I'm not sure we've landed on the perfect tool, but essentially when you're trying to um, go beyond the printed word and you're looking at people's body language and different people reacting to different comments, there's an interaction that happens in video that doesn't happen on paper. So this is something that we've had to also start thinking about. Using Zoom has meant that participation for teachers and students in these focus groups has been easier and more accessible. So whereas before we would have gone to say Atlanta and done teacher focus groups there, on Zoom it meant we could have teachers from Atlanta, from Houston, from um, Boston, all in the same focus group. And what that, that did for us actually was um, point out some regional differences in how uh, people might respond to these videos and the use of them in classrooms. So um, one very brief thing I can say is that um, there were some you know, political concerns that people expressed. Um, I think related, right, it was, this was right at the start of when there was the um, ginning up of um, anti-critical race theory and a supposed use in schools. And so even presenting a black mathematician talking about math, nothing else was enough to trigger a response from some teachers that I don't think I'd be able to use that in my classroom because of the climate we're in. It's, it's very, um, disheartening to think to think of this, but this was a real concern from some teachers in particular states. Um, if the mathematician had on a t-shirt that had a message on it, um, you know, there were some questions about that in some focus groups. Um, so just something to be aware of as we continue to move forward. And um, finally, uh, as I sort of alluded to, video recordings of focus groups allow us to see things we might not have seen otherwise. And so now the research team is having to, we, we had to train and, and really be looking for um, other things that might not, and important data points that might not be as visible and as accessible um, just from an oral interview or a printed transcript. Um, so I think there was a question about sort of who can access all this data. <laughs> Right, so we have 30 full length interviews. Uh, right now the researchers and the participants can see those. Um, some of them are so good, like uh, movie quality <laughs> with like really, you know, sort of in inspiring narratives that, you know, it would be great for the public to see them, but we, we want to talk with our participants and be ethical about that. But what everyone will eventually be able to see are the 90 excerpts that we've we've um, done so far. As you saw from Dr. Innes' video, most of them are about two to three minutes long. Some of them will live in this um, K through eight mathematics curriculum um, that Amplify is putting together. But the set of 90 will all live in a freely access uh, available public digital database. And we have a link that I hope someone can put in the chat to uh, a very sort of small website that has some sample videos on it. And we're asking for uh, some evaluative feedback so we can think about the uses of these videos for our next project. And um, I think that's it. I wanna thank, thank all of you for, for coming and for listening. Um, this is part of our research team. I'd like to thank my uh, collaborators, Robin Wilson, who's the co-PI, um, Nicole Fletcher, who's our elementary education consultant, and all the researchers and students on our team. I think I saw one of the students here. I think Tarika's here. And our project coordinators. Um, this project was again funded by NSF, housed at Teachers College, um, Columbia University, and as part of uh, the Gordon Institute for Urban and Minority Education, which I just have to say um, is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. 
And um, it's the oldest sort of institute of that kind in, in the country, as far as I'm aware, in terms of focusing on issues of urban education. I was proud to be its director, and um, I'm proud that this project is, is housed at that institute. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Walker. I see that there will be some questions for you at the end. You can preview them if you'd like. Um, and next, we're going to have a presentation. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. I thought it was Nanette. It is Dr. Joanne Lobato. Nanette will be after. Okay. Um, uh, thanks for the interesting presentation, Erica. I'm Joanne Lobato, and I'm from San Diego State University. I'm delighted to be here today and give you an overview of our um, NSF DRK-12 project. It's titled Developing and Investigating Unscripted Dialogic Mathematics Videos. Um, the co-PI in the project is John Groover from Michigan Tech. We also call ourselves Project Math Talk. And the overarching purpose of the grant is to create an alternative type of math video that features pairs of secondary school students engaged in dialogue as they work together to tackle challenging math problems. And then also to conduct a series of research studies that investigate what and how other students learn from those videos. So there's both a development and a research component. Um, I'm going to focus primarily on the development today, even though we used video in both aspects of the project. And I appreciate Catherine and Lonnie's flexibility in uh, giving us a choice about what direction we wanted to take the panel presentation. So I'd like to say just a, a few words about the motivation for this project. Uh, I think the pandemic really demonstrated um, the need, the tremendous need for high quality online instructional videos. Now, there are a large number of websites that offer math videos for students to learn from, but there is surprising uniformity across them. It's almost always an expository presentation by a talking head or talking hands, and the videos primarily present procedures, factual information, and worked examples without explaining why procedures work, unpacking mathematical relationships, or developing mathematical meanings. Uh, in our own review of hundreds of uh, grade K to 12 videos, we found that very few had voices of students. And when there were students in the videos, they were doing things like wrapping formulas as opposed to arguing and engaging in uh, mathematical explanation. Now, there are online math videos that show students communicating their math ideas, but they're primarily filmed for teachers rather than for students to learn directly from. So just to reiterate, the development goal of the project was to create you know, a new model for videos for secondary school students that feature pairs of students who explain and discuss their ideas, convey authentic confusion, and persist to resolve their mathematical struggles. In an exploratory a DRK-12 grant, we created two units of videos. In the current grant, um, we've filmed three more units and have three more in the works. Each unit is about 40 short videos. So it's learning over time. So it's about seven or, or eight lessons in each unit. And each lesson is broken into uh, four to six bite-sized episodes. All of these videos are available at our website, mathtalk.org. So it's our hope that by rethinking what math videos can look like, this will ha have value, not only for our own research program of figuring out what kids get from these videos, but hopefully it will influence or be useful to other programs as well. So for example, one of the largest areas of research on student learning from videos is the flipped classroom research. But you know, the videos used there are almost always expository and procedural, and that can be concerning because such videos can reinforce common student misconceptions 
and restrict the focus of subsequent classroom discussions. Now, the research on um, you know, teacher learning using video is much further along in terms of the range of the type of videos available. But um, having access to the same students learning over time and in a way that you can really see all of their inscriptions and work can have affordances. Uh, one study that came out uh, of our project that used the project videos showed that pre-service secondary teachers not only deepened their own mathematical understanding, but made gains in learning to decenter so they could distinguish their own reasoning from students' reasoning and were actually able to make pretty amazing predictions about what the kids in the videos would do next. So um, I just want to convey a couple of design decisions we made in developing these videos. The first, probably most important decision was to use unscripted rather than scripted student dialogue. And I'd like to share an example of our videos. I'm going to share a three minute video from our algebraic expressions unit. This features two grade nine students, Halima and Elijah, although he goes by ET. Uh, they were working on this task where they considered a game app context. They had talked about apps on their phones for a while and then considered this situation of three friends buying different numbers of apps. And um, the Halima and Iti, uh, decided how much each app should cost. And then they determined how much should be spent altogether. They kept varying that amount and eventually considered an unknown amount. And that's where we'll pick up, uh, where they generalize that reasoning and express it with algebra. This question is asking you to do. It's asking us to make the equation on a broader scale by using variables. Um, what letter of variable do you want to use, ET? Uh, we can use either X or we can use C for the cost. Um, you could do C. So I'm thinking like three and then three times C. Yes. Does that look good? Uh, yeah. Okay. We should probably put the equal sign just to. Yeah. Equals. Do you want to put T for the total or just? Or uh, let's put T. Now, you said what the two variables meant, but I've forgotten. Can one, ET, can you start and write what the C means? And then afterwards, I'll have Halima write down what the T means. Yes. So T means, or C, represents the total, no, the cost of each gain. Do you agree with that, Halima? Yeah. Okay, and then mm -hmm. write down what T means. Yeah, does that sound good to you, Ishi? T is the total amount of money spent. Yes. Who wants to take me through it? Halima? Halima, okay. why don't you start and then ET can add if you'd like to. So what we did was we took um, the numbers from the numbers that we were given. And then we already know that it's going to be three, two, and four, but we don't know the cost. So I just did three C 
or three times C plus two C and four C, which equals T, the total. So by using unscripted dialogue in these videos, I think it really captures the authentic uh, student problem solving. Um, and also, it, there's often displays of confusion. You didn't see one here, but it permeates a lot of the other videos. You know, at the beginning, we really worried that um, learners using these videos would find that confusion overwhelming or get more confused as a result. But in um, our studies, we are finding that high school students in general really value seeing the confusion of peers and believe that they're struggling and learning together. And I'm going to show you a one minute video uh, from our research. These two uh, young women had just watched a video in which the students in the video, their names were Sasha and Keone, had been quite confused. This was in a parabola unit. And the researcher stopped and asked if the learners would have preferred to have videos without confusion. They pretty strongly said they preferred the confused ones. And I want you to listen for the student who um, shares how she feels like an alien her, in her math class when she's confused. If you had a choice, like a Sasha and a Kiani who had that confusion about where to put the focus and then they figured it out versus let's say kids who just knew that it was one quarter and they knew how to place it, which would you rather watch? The confused one. How yeah. come? Does because it make you more confused? No, it's because you're learning with them. Mm -hmm. And you don't mind that? You like that? Mm -hmm. It helps okay. because sometimes you're, you feel like you're the only one. Yeah. yeah. And you're you learning like the alien. Yeah, you're classroom. learning step by step and they already you know. like the alien in the classroom? <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. There was one point in where I felt like he was doing, like he was giving me an example and I felt like I was the only alien there. Like they're always there's always someone confused at some point. Yeah. She goes on to say, when I get really confused, I get isolated, like I'm the only one. But then knowing that she, referring to one of the students in the video, is confused, we're both confused. So there's this idea of you know shared confusion helping students feel like they're not so alone or isolated. Another design decision we made was. Um, because of the pandemic, we had to quickly develop a protocol for filming remotely. Prior to the pandemic, we had a film studio where we could film students, and then we had to bring green screens out to kids' homes and film virtually. But the look of the videos is very similar, and Halim and E.T., who you just watched, were actually filmed remotely. Another decision was that the inscriptions, we found the inscriptions from the video participants really had to be displayed clearly for other students to learn from them. So when we were in the studio, we used a Cintiq display unit. And for the remote version, we used the Explain Everything digital whiteboard with iPads. So um, Catherine and Lonnie also asked us to talk about lessons learned. And I just wanted to share two. One is that the personality and nature of the relationship between the two kids in the videos really seems to matter. Uh, we enjoyed all of the pairs that we filmed, and I think there's value in watching each of the different pairs. But in showing a lot of these videos to other students and to teachers, one pair really stood out as this Sasha and Keone. And I think it's because they came in having had a long friendship, and which allowed them to push back on each other's mathematical thinking in a way that wasn't uncomfortable for either one of them. The other thing we learned from doing a bunch of focus testing with different video prototypes is that it's really important to annotate key features of the student's work and to summarize the main ideas that they have come up with. So you'll see here in this video that kids were placing lots of different dots, but one dot was really important. It was the focus of a parabola. And so we annotated that focus in the directory so that um, people watching the video could pick that out visually. And then we also, um, at the end of each video, summarize the kids' ideas, trying as close as they can to use their own words and sometimes their own, you'll see an example here where their own hands are moving. So I'm going to show you a one minute example of that. This is with um, the student Sasha and Keone. It's from our parabola unit. 
And it's not important that you understand what's happening mathematically here uh, in, in order to see our design decision of annotating and then summarizing. And then we can put our points. Let's make it, let's see, three inches away from that. Three inches away from that. Let's extend our directrix a little. So now both of our points. Is that three? Three. So yeah. So, <laughs> so now our two points. Okay, a point to the focus is three inches, and a point to the directrix is three inches. Same over here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Keone has discovered a new method. He first places the focus three inches from the directrix. Then he places a point three inches to one side of the focus and a point three inches to the other side of the focus. These two points work because each point is the same distance from the focus as it is from the directrix, namely three inches. So I just wanted to also um, thank the members of the research team at, at both research sites. This is so cool. I'm very inspired by all of your work. I cannot wait to keep hearing more. I hope everybody else is enjoying it as much as I am. Um, thank you so much, Joanne. Um, we are going to turn it over now to Nanette Sego. Hi. Thank you for the very interesting presentations, Joanne and Erica. Let's see, share. Okay, today um, I'm going to talk about um, about a professional development. Let's see if it's going. A professional development project focused on video, in which we're um, in our well, it's a four year project, and we're in, in our fifth year of finalizing the project. And I have a project team that represents this work. It's not showing. Um, that I'd like to thank, I, as, as all of you have. It's it's not just me. It's a team, and it's not just this team. There's more people behind the scenes. So, um, okay. So it's not. I'm sorry. Okay. So the, I apologize. Somehow it's not moving along. Um, the video in the middle project that I'm um, going to talk about is an asynchronous professional development design. And um, the PD components I'm going to describe through our four key design decisions and examples that Catherine and Lonnie had asked for us to share. So the key design decision one was to use video based specified PD content and pedagogy that worked well in the past. So what we did was we adapted um, the learning and teaching linear functions face-to-face video-based uh, mathematics PD materials to an asynchronous format. And um, our aim was actually to get quality PD out to more teachers. And this was very heavily designed and specified and uh, required a lot of face-to-face -face time. And so we decided to um, create 40 open educational resource um, two-hour modules that are centered around videos, um, short video clips up to five minutes that present classroom instruction, student thinking, and teacher decision making. And they're focused around specified mathematical knowledge for teaching goals. So all the video clips are interactions between teacher, student, and students around a mathematical content. <laughs> So key decision number two, 
create self-contained online modules, no longer than two hours in length that utilize video at the center, surrounded by pre and post video activities um, that allow users choices around pedagogy and content goals. So I'll give you an example of the structure of the two-hour module design. So it's all centered around the video, hence video in the middle. And there are pre-video activities and post-video activities that are, are elements in this two-hour module design. So um, they begin, teachers begin by exploring the math tasks that they will see the students working on in the video. Um, they will share, they share a picture of their work and upload it to a community wall. And they look at others, their peers' methods, and then they comment on those. Um, and then they're asked to consider alternative perspectives and approaches by examining um, what we call a solution methods document, which I can I will share with you later, and compare that to their peers. And they also consider a mathematician's perspective by um, looking at a PowerPoint. And then in the video portion of the structure, they review the classroom context, um, understanding what happened before and after the video clip and um, the mathematical storyline of that lesson. Then they watch a clip um, with focus questions to um, look and analyze. And then they um, reflect on some lesson resources, um, lesson graphs and solution methods, which I'll share with you a bit later. Then they analyze a segment of the transcript where um, we used we used now comment. They went in, there was a segment with some probing questions. They um, responded to it and then their colleagues could respond to that. And I'll also share that with you a, a bit later. And then in the post video, oops. Sorry, in the post video, they revisit um, a video with math educator comments that are at key moments in the videos there where math educator commentary and then they discuss um, those then they reflect on a on a community wall um, with sentence starters like I used to think and now I think and then finally um, to move from video analysis to um, what we call the so what how do I use this in my practice what am I taking away to think about um, we have a bridge to practice activity that um, bridges from the work they've done in the video um, analysis portion to thinking about their own practice. And then finally, there's a, a journal module reflection um, that asks them what they felt they learned and what new ideas they might take and use in their practice. So key design decision three, um, it was to embed key facilitation moves. Um, into the activities, discussion boards, focusing on noteworthy events, student strengths, and encourage teachers to make connections to their own teaching. I mean, part of the design decisions moving from a face-to-face -to, -face to an asynchronous setting was to think about um, the role that facilitation moves or prompts and questions could play in the design decisions that we made. So I'll give you an example of each of the of, of this. So um, in video activity seven, um, activity seven of the of the module, here's the annotated video transcript that I talked a little bit about, where there's a selected transcript from that video. There's some focus questions to consider, and then they're to post a comment. And then as you can see, this is a sample of a comment and some responses from teachers to that comment and um, around that video transcript. And in the bridge to practice activity, they're asked to compare uh, two different uh, teachers, an algebra one and a grade six goals and launches for the same mathematical task and consider how they're similar and how they differ. And then what would the goals be that they would use if they were to use that task with their students and how might they launch that task? So decision number four um, was, a big decision, and we realized, uh, I guess, by looking back at our face-to-face -face materials, um, the importance of alternative perspectives. Alternative perspectives from peers, from resources, from mathematicians, math educators, um, within the various module activities across all three phases. So I'll give you an example um, in each phase, how we inserted alternative perspectives and how important we felt that was. 
So they explore the math themselves. Um, and it's the math test that they'll watch students um, sharing their solutions from. And then they, as I said, they'll share a picture of their work and take some time to look at the solutions of others and in comments um, to their peers. Uh, and then they consider other perspectives. So they consider and compare various solution methods and corresponding representations by comparing it to what we call a solution methods document. And then they consider the slideshow of a mathematician's perspective on the task. The mathematician's perspective is on the task uh, and the math educator's perspective is on the video episode. So this is a solution methods document for the task of the video clip that, I, that you have an example of. So this is a solution methods document that accompanies all um, of the modules for all tasks so that it allows people to look at this and analyze it, think about what's might missing, um, where their solution might fit, where their peer solutions might fit. Um, so it's just a, a, another resource with alternative perspectives. And then um, in the post video, they revisit the video with the math educator comments. And so you'll see that the math educator comments are, are time stamped and, um, and they're asked to read the comments and um, if they're engaging with others to discuss them or share their thoughts with their colleagues. So what lessons have we learned so far? Because <laughs> it feels like it's continuing. Um, we learned in both the face-to-face -face and the asynchronous design, the importance of situating the short video clip within a whole lesson. So the teacher's sense of the mathematical storyline of the lesson, as well as what came before and after the video clip. Otherwise they make assumptions that aren't true is what we found out about where, where that clip sat, what happened before, they just, they had to fill it in. Um, and, and so we share these, we use these lesson graphs across all of them to help them see where the video clip is situated. Um, so that's, that's our representation to do that. I think there's probably other ways that people could do that, but that was a lesson that we learned. Another one was the video in the middle modules allowed us to provide flexible and convenient access to high quality learning opportunities and therefore allowed us to reach more teachers. Um, embedding key facilitation moves into the design appeared to support teachers' positive experiences. For example, the teacher said, I can go at my own pace. It was almost like it was facilitated because there were questions that you had to answer. We weren't having discussions necessarily, but there was group input. So they kind of felt like they were part of a group and facilitated because of the prompts. Um, and the, the independent time that is unique to asynchronous online platforms allows for teachers to step back and contemplate ideas at their own pace. It gave teachers a time to pause and reflect independently before engaging and space to think and space to share. One of the things we learned when following, um, we did a, a small RCT pilot to study what happened. What we found was that the teachers, the times in which they responded to others would vary. It wasn't immediate. And we thought about our experiences in face-to-face -face PD in which people are on the spot and you, that's the moment that you have to respond and then it moves on. In this case, they could think about it and respond two days later or three days later. Um, and they would go back and forth. And we found that happened a lot. So the space and time, and there's some people that aren't very quick to jump in that need the space to think. And this gave them space that it was a bit of a, I guess it's, we should have known it, but it was still a surprise to us that um, how valuable uh, this setting, the, the platform was for teachers. Okay, finally, I'll see. And I'll stop sharing. So I just want to thank you all. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to pass them on through the chat. So Rich, I have not seen your work, Nanette, in a while. So it's really cool to see um, how it's taken shape. It's amazing. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. And last but certainly not least, we've got Heather Hill to share with us. Hi all, um, let's see, hmm. can you see my screen? It's not in presenter view yet, I'm working it, on it. It's, yeah, it's the wrong screen, we're seeing your uh, oh, no. uh, folder and stuff. Let me try again, um, there we go. Okay, so this should work. And then it's yeah, just- Yeah, there you go. All right, great. All right, well, thank you for the really interesting presentations. Um, what I found really fascinating was the way that you were thinking about 
design decisions in light of learning on the part of teachers or students or parents or whoever the target of the videos were. I'm going to talk about something quite different. Um, I'm going to talk about research projects that use video to study mathematics instruction at scale. And there's a bonus section on the mysterious afterlife of some of that video. Um, so a bit of background before we begin. So um, I'm going to talk about three large scale quantitative projects that measure teacher knowledge, math instruction, and student outcomes. The first one is um, called National Center for Teacher Effectiveness. This took place about 10 years ago now. And the goal was to correlate aspects of teachers' mathematical knowledge, their mathematics classroom instruction, and student outcomes. And so we wanted for the classroom mathematics portion of this to be able to say, um, teacher Erica on average has this level of student reasoning going on in her classroom. And that and led to lots of design decisions that we made down the line. So those decisions, uh, the first one was to take three videos per teacher per year over three years. And we had about 300 teachers in our data set. So that resulted obviously in 2,700 videos. Um, and what that larger number of videos per teacher got us was more accurate scores. So had we just walked in on a couple days and videotaped a couple days of a teacher teaching, we wouldn't be able, I think, to characterize the amount of student reasoning going on on average in that teacher's classroom. Because as we all know, some curriculum materials, the less that particular lesson gives you a great opportunity to do some student reasoning. And some days you're just not using a lesson that does, or you're doing test prep, or there's something else going on in your classroom. So those larger number of videos was really necessary to get those sort of accurate average teacher scores. Another decision we made was um, to focus the video and the audio on what teachers were doing in the classroom and teacher-student interactions, and in particular, the sort of voices of students. So we had to have really high quality audio collected during, um, during this project. We scored the video using a standardized observation instrument, and we transcribed the videos before scoring to improve the accuracy of, um, of that instrument, so, or the, of the scoring. So that's project number one. Projects two and three were both impact evaluations of mathematics professional development. So these are randomized experiments of PD meant to improve teacher knowledge and increase the use of student-centered instruction. Um, Again, we collected a relatively large number of videos per teacher between five and six, and that resulted given sample size in between six, in between six and 700 teachers per study. Um, we again scored it with the MQI, and we again focused on those teachers, what teachers were doing, and on those teacher-student interactions. Okay, so here comes the part about like, what did you learn? Um, one of the things that we learned was uh, really critical across all the studies was coders. So, we had about 10 people on this project. Erica Licky, who's on the call today, was one of them. And if I said to Erica, we have the 4,000 videos to study to, to code and 700 of them are yours, Erica probably would not have been so very happy or finished her PhD. So um, what we had to do was hire large numbers of coders. Um, what we decided to do to make sure that we were getting the coders that were going to be able to apply the, uh, the rubric with fidelity was to pre-screen them based on their mathematical knowledge for teaching and on their teaching experience. So interestingly enough, there's other observation instruments that actually prefer undergraduates who've never taught and really have never spent time studying mathematics or classrooms or any kind of classrooms at all. They say that they are more accurate, but for our own instrument, it felt like you had to have been a teacher to kind of understand decisions that teachers were making and what was going on in the classroom and so on and so forth. We developed online training for these coders, we ended up with upwards of 100 coders across four different studies. I didn't tell you about one of them. That was a large study that was actually run out of ETS um, called the MET study. We developed certification. So after folks went through training, we had to make sure that they could apply our rubric accurately. And so we had to develop a certification assessment. And then good practice in sort of um, large scale coding is to um, do sort of weekly or biweekly calibration where raters look at a clip, they score it, Rather than sort of firing people based on those data, which we did a little bit of firing, but um, we more used it as professional development for raters. So like if, you know, um, AH was not getting something right consistently, we would say, okay, like we're going to have a conversation about how this raider is using uh, a particular code like student, uh, student reasoning. Um, okay, and so also we had to supply dozens of master coded videos for a couple of these projects because for one project, raters took a certification test 
every day before they started scoring. And so that was a large amount of video that we had to turn over completely master scored. Okay. So lots of master scoring happened. And actually on the left-hand side, you can see this is one of our spreadsheets from master scoring. I don't think Erica was actually there that week so just because I don't see EL, but you can see people are all over the board about the kinds of like we watched three minutes and then you had all of these differences of opinion about the kinds of things that people thought were going on and how they mapped on to the MQI. So that was fun times. I've spent many years in many, many coding meetings. All right, so here's some wisdom of practice from that era of my using video life. Um, so uh, first, I and these are in no particular order, by the way. So um, I think that there's a tension between what we call mechanical scoring, like teacher does observable thing X, get score Y, like a function, and holistic scoring. Um, when we started developing the MQI, which is our own sort of in-house instrument, we had said like it was a tight team of people working at Michigan. Even if a teacher had done something that didn't meet the letter of the law, if it met the spirit of that code, man, we were going to give that teacher credit for it. Like we understood like, okay, the kids got something. They got something actually pretty special out of that, um, out of that little uh, interaction with the teacher. When you have that many coders, you are stuck doing mechanical coding because those webinars, those weekly calibration webinars or bi-weekly calibration webinars are just hard. Like raiders are gonna ask and they are held to the, their feet are held to the fire about how well they apply those codes. And so we have to be able to say, okay, if X happened, then Y. And what you end up with was a, is a very elaborated scoring guidance and a lot of kind of just like a little bit cringy, like, oh, that felt really bad. It, didn't, it felt really bad, but we're not gonna sort of like downscore it. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. I would do holistic scoring if I could, but on a large scale, it's not actually that possible. A second thing, um, sort of wisdom of practice, and this is actually field, uh, sort of has um, been generated by people in the field. Shanice Campbell and Matt Ronfeld have a nice paper in A or J that showed that there's a small but observable bias in the MET data against male teachers and against classrooms where there are students, more students of color, those classrooms are often taught by teachers of color. And so, you know, it's sort of like next step in this field is actually to try to figure out how not, well, we can control out some of that bias on the back end using stats, but like how to prevent it from happening in the first place. And obviously this has much more implications when you're talking about like principals or raters walking into classrooms doing high stakes observations for teachers. The third thing um, I think the wisdom of practice is you know, we designed all these online resources. We designed this MQI certification uh, training. We designed, we have actually have a nice video library where all the master coded clips are in the library and you can look at our coding and you can use them in professional development. But the minute somebody updates their browser, like it's all just broken. And um, the problem is it costs like $30,000 to fix this stuff, which is not enough to write a grant proposal for, but it's not enough, but it's too much for me just to be like, oh, I've got $30,000 laying around, which I don't. So, um, you know, we end up with like somebody's cousin's best friend who's a 21 year old who codes stuff and is willing to do it on the slot. Like we've had to sort of get by and it's like a little stressful to have stuff so broken so much of the time. It's always good to remember when you're looking at these scores, any kind of observation scores, they are super noisy. Like a lot of people were gonna, are gonna tell you that they're not, but they are so noisy. Um, and what happens is there's like, a lot of people will report inter-rater agreement, but that's only part of the story. Um, you know, there is also, excuse me, these occasion effects, like walking in on a day when the, the teacher is doing a lot of reasoning versus walking in on a day when the teacher doesn't have an opportunity to do that. You start to add all these sources of noise up and they, they are, constitute a large fraction of the variability in teacher scores. And finally, human scoring is really expensive, so it's pretty prohibitive. Like, I'm just trying to plan a couple studies right now where we're, you know, in particular districts needing to watch pre-service teachers teach, and we are just stuck. It's like, okay, so do we hire people and train them to go down and, like, watch? Or it's just, or do we have people do video, which has become harder and harder to do with IRB and with teacher permissions? So um, it's just been a big, it's a big problem. But this leads me to my next, uh, the mysterious afterlife part of this talk. So um, so when I started transcribing this video, people thought I was nuts because it was like a hundred bucks a video. And they were like, it's such a huge amount of money that goes to these transcriptions agencies. And 
like I, you know, I was going to spend it anyway. So I did, but, um, so it turns out that that video transcription trove, like those transcribed lessons have been completely amazing in terms of being able to start to think about how to automate scoring of what happens in classrooms. And so this is work I'm doing with Dora Dembski at Stanford and also Jing Liu, who doesn't happen to be on this paper, but has been an active partner in all of this. Um, and trying to figure out ways that we can take those costs down by supplementing potentially human scoring with some automated um, automated measures. So I'll tell you a tiny bit about this. Um, so we use a natural language processing approach, and we specifically measure math instruction. And the goal is really to develop automated scoring algorithms. So you can take a, a transcript and like run it through one of these machines and out will pop a score for that particular lesson. So it's actually interesting to hear earlier in this presentation, Dr. Innes talking about some of the machine learning because that is actually what is going on in some of these, some of these models. Um, but the, the goal is to have the models do the scoring rather than humans doing the scoring. So we use classroom transcripts and we parse them into teacher-student utterance pairs. So like teacher says something, student says something or vice versa for some of our measures. And there's two ways that we can go about scoring using these natural language processing measures. The first is actually just to use established kind of packages that come from the NLP world. So here's an example. So uptake during conversation, like the extent to which Lonnie says something, and then I kind of follow it up with like, I, by incorporating her comment into my next move is actually something that linguists care a lot about. It predicts a lot of things, including like, you know, warmth, weirdly enough dating success in speed dating like they run you know these models on speed dating data um it actually is also something that we care a lot about in math classrooms like a lot of people say you know uptaking student responses really makes students feel like they're heard it makes them feel like they have some mathematical authority same with student reasoning uh we can also measure that oh sorry let me finish the, the uptake so it turns out there's these uptake models and you just run them on the NCE transcript data set and they you know, kick out scores actually for those lessons. And you can get teacher level scores by aggregating. Student reasoning is the same. Um, lots of sort of generic packages for measuring reasoning construction, like if then, because, and it does pretty well when you run them on um, classroom transcripts and mathematics. What we found to be more successful though, um, possibly because it uses a little bit more human judgment, is uh, human labeling of these a, of these transcript data sets to detect those patterns in conversations. So what we do, for instance, with uptake, we would have a student talk and then the teacher follow up. And we have our raters go in and say, was there uptaking there? And they do that for 600 iterations of sort of student teacher pairs. And then we go back and we send that data into AI and they detect conversational patterns based on the labeling that we have just applied. So they're like, the machine is like, I notice that when you say there's uptaking, there's a lot of congruence of words. There's a lot of congruence of verb structures. And so they're able actually pretty well to detect some of these, um, some of these uh, kinds of things that we care about in the math ed world. And well, I'll show you just actually in the next slide what I mean by, by well. Um, I'm an optimist, so you may see these as small correlations, but I, I see them as miracles. So, um, so here's what here's what uh, this, how to read this table. So the NLP measures are on the left hand side. On the far right hand side is the correlation to same item, human rated. I think MQI scores. Um, yeah, I think these are MQI scores for the most part. Um, and then in the middle is correlation to value added, like teacher level value added for that for that year. And you can see, for instance, uptaking does correlate. Um, interestingly enough, it doesn't correlate as well with the human rated uh, MQI scores as it does with value added, suggesting that humans in the machine might be measuring two different constructs, which we would love to investigate. Um, focusing questions uh, is another thing that we can measure, correlates well to value added and to the same item MQI score. And then that student reasoning measure that I told you, um, you know, raters and the machines agree, not like at catastrophic, like not catastrophic, but like not terrific numbers, but like enough that I'm just shocked that machines can actually um, can actually replicate this over large, a large data set. And that also predicts value added scores. And these are all in regressions controlling for a bunch of different stuff that we know predicts outcomes in classrooms. All right. So TBD, 
in this new world um, requires really high audio capture, high quality audio capture. Like you need to be able to get the student voices at the back of the room to know whether they're reasoning, to know whether there has been uptaking by the teacher and so on and so forth. So Lonnie, I will be shooting you an email afterwards to ask you about that. Um, there's dialect bias. So we know that like Southern accents, for instance, like don't get picked up as well in these big kind of AI environments. It's above my pay grade to work on that, but we're aware of that and trying to build that into what we're doing. There's a whole host of big brother guardrails. Like this is data that's coming out of classrooms, going into big machines. Some of the companies that do it are for-profit companies and it makes you a little worried. And so like we need to have a sort of way in which we're protecting the privacy both of teachers and of students. And then um, there's also a sense that maybe some of this might be better for teacher feedback. So, you know, one of the things that these models do actually, Dora just built an app where a teacher can record what's going on in her classroom, get it run through the, the models. The model will tell the teacher, like, here's your amount of uptake. Here were some really good examples of uptake. Think about like, here's some tips for uptaking more the next time you teach math. And so she's been, and we're, well, we've been running um, RCTs of this kind of feedback in uh, instructional environments and finding that teachers actually will improve on the practice that we're giving them the feedback on. And looks like there's some impacts on not like down the line district, you know, state tests or anything like that, but on things like course completion and those sort of middle ground kinds of um, kinds of indicators. All right, so if there's questions, um, you can shoot them, put them in the chat, but you'd also shoot me an email. So, and I have to say, if you're gonna shoot me an email, like um, I apologize if I don't get right back to you, I will try to get back to you. But if you haven't heard from me, just email me again, often the best way to get to me. All right, thanks all. Thank you so much, Heather. And um, hopefully we'll have some questions now so people don't have to um, put anything else in your inbox. We had some questions put in the chat. They were some of them, uh, the Q&A rather, some of them were answered um, through uh, typed responses, especially Dr. Walker, who was our first presenter. Um, I'm wondering if maybe we wanna like share out some of the questions though. Erica, do you wanna talk a little bit about some of the questions you got and, and how you responded? Um, sure. And maybe sure. you can do the same. Sure, I'm happy to. Um, one of the questions was about our use of um, professional videographers or video editor editors, and somehow <laughs> in all of my talking, I did not, not did not acknowledge Silver Rose Productions, who um, is a production company that Amplify found, and they have been terrific. So when I did talk about sort of the producers behind the scene on the Streamyard. That was Silver Rose. So Silver Rose did that. They also were the ones who sort of edited once we chose clips between um, Amplify, the research team, and Silver Rose. They edited the clips. They're the ones who put together the animations and the music and the production. So the reason why those look so good is um, due in large part to Silver Rose. So I think that was an important part of that of this project. Um, we budgeted for it. We of course could have just had some little Zoom videos and put them up <laughs> and you know done something ourselves. I guess the animations are so cute though. I yeah, it would not have looked anywhere near as good or as professional. Mm -hmm. And the kids and the teachers love them. They love the animations and all of the. Um, the other thing I will say that Silver Rose did um, keep suggesting was that the mathematicians talk to the camera. So children and teachers would feel like the mathematician was talking to them. And a number of teachers and students both commented on that and how much they liked that. So I think that was an important contribution. And I'm gonna pause you there because Joanne, I'm curious to know about like, you showed us that you had green screens and so on, but were you producing those videos? Did you like, once you captured the film and captured what the kids were doing in their pair work, did you just edit all that together or did you have some professional help? No, it's all, we, we're, a, we're a low budget uh, organization here. <laughs> we had one, uh, we have one uh, tech guy who does all of the production. Um, but because the, so, so he's not a math educator. So uh -huh. he does involve the team to take the raw edited video of the kids and what you're trying to do is tell a story with that video. So if we shoot, say, an hour and a quarter with kids, probably about 25 minutes of that will end up um, in the lesson that other kids are going to see. 
So you're, um, you know, editing out um, super long pauses, conversations that are off track and so on. And then um, our research team members, so myself and some doctoral students, we actually um, write down to the person producing it, which things need to be annotated, where the cuts need to occur, how to put things together. And then we write a script for the summary. And then one of the students is the voice who uh, does the voiceover for that. So it's all produced in house. Yeah. Probably not quite as professional looking as the Silver Rose Studio. It's interesting that, that you were able to use them. But um, it if you look at our early videos, the two guys that were really working on our animated summaries got better and better as time went on and as they learned about more bells and whistles that they could use for those animated summaries. Really cool. Nanette, did you use any, Was your were your videos in-house as well? Materials. So what we had to do was take them, um, our production team, and um, they placed them into Vimeo. They're all subtitled, um, but the clip and then, you know, our our technical people made the videos a little bit better. They were videos from years ago. It's amazing how they still um, bring a lot of conversation. But uh, so we had to adapt them for online use. But yeah, that makes sense. And then, Erica, you got uh, another question about um, what you do to help the teachers feel comfortable on Zoom to keep their cameras on. Yes, um, I think for both the um, students and the teachers in particular, the question was about, you know, people on Zoom sometimes turn their cameras off. And if you want, if you're holding an interview or a focus group, you, you kind of want to see them. Um, and I, if I remember correctly, it may have actually been in our recruitment materials, but definitely in our follow-up letters, we talk about, you know, the kind of community we're going to, we'd like to have during this focus group, like it's important for everyone to see each other. And we wrote it very positively. And then I do think the icebreakers, um, at the beginning help. I was very, um, reluctant because I hate icebreakers myself. <laughs> but they really do work and we use uh, they're super short and we use them for the kids and for the adults and that seems to really help increase the level of engagement and no one has really turned their camera off unless they had to you know take care of something so it's been good yeah. um has anyone else had to contend with any like participant reluctance to be filmed or how do you coax people to be filmed I, I can talk just a little bit about because we did we did some taping this year as well. Um, I think one of the things that was important to us um, in videotaping classrooms and episodes that we always gave the teacher um, the opportunity to look at whatever videos we might use and the clips that we might choose. And if they said no, we wouldn't use it. And that was always yeah. known to them ahead of time that we that was honored and respected. Um, we didn't have anybody say no. We gave them a sense of how we might use it and the questions we'd use with it, but. Um, that was an opportunity for them to, um, you know, not just throw themselves out there and then not know what was going to happen with their work. It's interesting because a, a few of you have um, projects where the part of, there's a video production element for like a larger audience, um, but the what that audience is and just how like being a part of a textbook, you know, seems like the, the production value has to be so much higher than it would for like a PD. You know, teachers are going to be a little more forgiving if you don't have like, you didn't have boom mics in the classroom getting every, you know, with Foley artists in the background getting the chalk on the board or whatever. Um, okay, great. And then Joanne, you had a question posed to you about um, the students who are using the videos, like the ones you showed us the interview of, did they have a hard time making sense because the genre is so much about right answers, um, about seeing confusion? 
Yeah, so, you know, when we first um, made our prototypes and started, I just had really no idea how kids were going to respond to these. I thought that the confusion might be too much. And especially since most of the kids are coming from traditional uh, years and years of instruction, tra traditional instruction, um, the question asker asked if we told the, the research participants in advance that the kids in the videos were going to be confused at times. We did not. We just said they were going to be watching videos of, you know, other kids solving math problems and talking with each other. Um, and much to my surprise of the 50 kids that we've involved in various research studies, only three of them stand out to me as really, say, you know, wanting to advance the video to the part where the voice comes on and does the summary, which to me feels like more of a, an effect of traditional instruction where you want to just hear what's correct and what's been resolved. Um, in to my great surprise and pleasure, kids seem to really value seeing the thing, the, the, the other ideas that kids come up with, the confusion that they express um, but I think it's also important that we do show the resolution of that. We keep filming until the kids resolve their issues. We never, we don't tell them the how to resolve that, but we we try to capture that natural resolution. And so, in the research studies, you see kids coming to really value and trust the kids in the video and that they're going to figure it out. It's interesting to me because I have um, two kids in their twenties and a teenager and the the videos that they watch they'll watch things like people playing a video game which is so bizarre to me like the the genres of videos that they consume are very much outside of my direct experience and presumably yours as well and so maybe there's something about watching somebody in process doing something isn't as odd even though the genre of um explainer oh. videos tends to be expositional like you said so i don't know that's really that's a really interesting point so interesting to me um there was a question that came up during uh your your presentation nanette about whether the d discussion boards and posts are moderated for doing some kind of a response for that but i can elaborate a bit which i didn't talk about um, in my presentation, because I wanted to focus it on lessons learned and decisions, which was we we conducted a small RCT um, pilot in which we, uh, one of the questions that we had was, um, did, did they need to be facilitated? So we had three conditions. We had a locally facilitated group um, that were co uh, facilitated by coaches. Then we had a West Ed facilitated group, and then we had a structured independent group. And um, we studied all conditions. Um, and found in two different analyses, which we, we've written about and I can share with you later, we found that um, to this point, there's no, there's no difference across conditions for participation. In fact, the structured independent is almost, we're studying right now, we're doing a transactivity um, analysis using UNET All's coding scheme. And what we're finding is that the structured independent is almost more um, interactive and they even comment to the math educator comments. I agree with her comment. I think this is this, or I disagree with that. So that they're commenting to static comments that are, you know, put into the uh, materials. And so um, it's interesting to us. One of the things that made us wonder is, is it more about design and less about facilitation? We had assumptions that the facilitation group groups would have, um, you know, we would have more impact on teacher learning, but they didn't. So we wondered if the design um, mattered in this case. So we're still examining that um, and seeing if there's if there's any differences across conditions. But also, one more thing I want to say that we found out that was interesting is people that are facilitators that are used to facilitating in person that go online to facilitate and try to ask the same kind of questions they would face to face somehow there were differences in the way they were perceived by the teachers. So there was either a status issue that was bothersome, they would take things, you know how you 
can write an email and someone can take it in a very different way and they insert tone that we found happened so that people would think, oh, this person was, is, is chastising me about something. And in fact, it was a real question. So there were differences in the ways in which people had to moderate or facilitate um, that didn't emerge in face-to-face. -face, so. That makes sense. Um, I didn't realize we have some fabulous new questions coming in um, in the Q&A, and we have five minutes left. So I'm going to ask my panelists to read some of them. Um, there's there's one about IRB, especially for young kids. Um, there's one about frameworks for data analysis and data reduction. Heather, maybe you should take data reduction, although you don't really, you actually date code all your data. You don't do data reduction. Well, I mean, we reduce it by coding it. So yeah, yeah. that's true. Because we're losing a lot when you, when, anytime you apply code, mm -hmm. you lose a lot. So that's how we deal with it. I think this, the, for me, the spinoff one, you know, has been this amazing afterlife of these video transcripts. And we're in the middle, like, um, so what's fashionable these days is to run prizes to offer prizes. Is this in the math ed world yet? It's in the AI world. What's and that? so our, our, it's like, we say, we'll pay you $50,000, not we, somebody else. Uh, we'll pay you $100,000 if you can like figure out an algorithm. Using oh yeah, 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 yeah. Like, yada, 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 yada. So I know this from my kid who does like, yeah. the, they're called bounties. A yes. lot of times. Yeah. yeah. So it's a big thing. And like once we're in one right now with this data set, but once it's done, it will be released publicly, all of it. So this is the cool thing. Like we've always made all of our data available through ICPSR, um, except those transcripts. Um, and so you can, any researcher in math ed can take the transcripts, can take the data that's sitting up on ICPSR and actually do their own thing with it and investigate their own questions. Um, and that's one of the beauties of all of this, like depositing data um, in the norm in, in natural language processing is also you have to publicly deposit all your data so anyone can have access to it. And it's just been terrific to see other people be able to take it up and kind of do what they want. Anyone want to tell an IRB story? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on that one. Um, <laughs> much to my great surprise, the SDSU IRB deemed that our filming of the kids did not constitute research. So we did not have to get IRB what? approval. Yeah. What but the I, there's no way I'm going to put images of children on the web without both the kids and the parents consenting. So I created consent forms and assent forms for the kids. They just weren't stamped by um, the SDSU IRB. But um, it was only the research on other kids learning from them that had to go through our IRB. That's wild, Joanne. Absolutely wild. Um, Heather, how do you do IRB? You have, I mean, do you you must have to do passive consent for the kids, right? You just have to get consent from the teachers or? It depends upon the district. So we've done active consent and we've had teachers send home, you know, sheets of paper and then they come back and then we seat kids without permissions from their parents outside of camera range because our camera can't capture the whole classroom anyway. Um, and then back in the day, the IRB did not consider voices to be identifying, now they do. So I don't know how that's gonna play out. Um, I think more so than our IRB, I think the district's IRB have been much more tricky for us in recent years. So districts are really like, wanna protect their teachers, which makes complete sense. Um, they wanna prioritize research that's in their interest and where they're gonna get something out of it. And that's been a sort of harder hill to climb. Our best success has been when we have a friend in the district who can get us on the phone with the IRB officer right away um, and let us hash out some of the like, can we do this? Can we do this? How does it work? Like, just because otherwise you're sort of like stumbling around in the dark on some of this IRB stuff with districts. You're like, I don't know what they want, but I'm going to say this. And then, you know, it's like an endless process of them yeah. telling you you're doing it wrong. So that's my only, that's my only suggestion um, for the district IRB stuff. Um, data analysis, we didn't really talk about, Delene. I, um, but what about data and analysis platforms, especially for people who do like qualitative data analysis? Does anyone do qualitative data analysis of video data? You do, Joanne, what, what have you been using these days? Uh, 
I'm, I haven't used anything really amazing. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I haven't so, either. Yeah. So, I mean, we do have our research specialist compile um, the video of both the um, different views of the um, learners learning from the video and the video on the same video together. And that's helpful in our analysis. Um, but for me, the hard work is it comes at the beginning of you know, situ getting a, a framework of the data reduction. We do a lot of um, descriptive accounts first. And then we really do coding sort of informally since these are smaller data sets for the um, research studies without using um, additional software products. That's great. Okay, I realize we're at time. I, I'm so in, engrossed in our conversation. I'm, I'm doing a bad job of managing time, but um, we will be sending out uh, email to all the participants with um, the resources that were mentioned today and with an opportunity to um, sign up for smaller consultation groups. We're kind of figuring out what our topics will be, but it'll give you an, uh, an opportunity to engage with our today's panelists. And I'll run one as well um, on some of the issues that were brought up today. Um, and we'll we'll take your, your questions as, as topics that are of potential interest. Thank you to all the panelists so much for sharing your work. Thank you to everyone who is here today. And hopefully we'll see you uh, again next time. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye.